Hi everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Amanda Benton and I am an assistant director of alumni relations at Marist and I graduated in the class of 2011. Um, we're very excited to share this panel with you this afternoon featuring a number of alumni currently living in the greater Philadelphia area. And I'm joined here by night, joined here tonight, this afternoon, whatever time it is, um, by uh, Desmond Murray, who's the associate director for employer experience at Marist. Hey Desmond. Hello, I just want to say hi and the team from the Center for Career Services wants to thank everyone for joining uh, this first Marist Mentor Marketplace Philly. So we just want to say hello from the Center for Career Services at Marist College. Thanks, Desmond. Um, just some technical notes before we get started. Due to the number of participants, we have muted all lines except for the panelists. Um, if you have questions, you can use the chat feature. You should be able to send it to either all panelists, or if you'd like, you can send it directly to Scott McVeigh, who will be our moderator for this evening. Um, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. Um, if you're having any audio challenges, I'm going to put the phone number directly in the chat box right now. Um, so you can use that if you're having trouble hearing through your computer. Um, as far as visually, there are several ways you can look at the presentation on a desktop computer or a laptop. Um, at the top center of your screen, you should be able to click on view options so you can pick something that works for you. If you are on a phone, you should be able to uh, scroll left and right to switch between the chat and the video screen. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Scott McVeigh. Graduated from Marist in 1991 with a degree in communication, and he was a member of the varsity swim team. He recently became an industry principal at Anna after working as VP of service delivery at Deloitte for the last five years. He was instrumental in starting the Philadelphia chapter of the Marist Alumni Association and is currently the president of this chapter. Scott, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Amanda, and, and the entire Marist team for, for supporting us as we host our first official Philadelphia chapter event. It's uh, very exciting. Um, we tried to get this going right before the pandemic started and, and that that took the wind out of our sails, but it, it didn't stop us at all. Like we're gonna keep going and we'll we'll find a way to to keep going and build a community here in Marist to at, at, in Philadelphia to to track back to Marist to make sure that we're 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 keeping connected to the school. So thank you all for joining. Um, I think we've got a, a a great a great conversation today, especially topical with uh, just the the kind of upheaval that we've experienced here and how hard it can be to to find a new job and to find a new opportunity in this sort of remote working environment. So the fact that we've got in our alumni group um, um, some very strong voices in in today's conversation, and again in the one that we're going to do later on in the winter. Um, so without any further ado, I'm, I'm going to introduce our, our panelists today because uh, I think we've got some, some really great folks lined up for you. So uh, Tom Peters graduated from Marist in 2000 with a BA in political science. And upon graduation, he went on to become a social studies teacher at Lakeland High School and then achieved his master's degree in instructional technology from Western Connecticut State. After leaving Lakeland High, he, he was appointed by Governor David Patterson to serve as the Director of E-Learning for the New York State Higher Education Services Corporation, where he developed the online financial literacy program for New York Helps Student Loan Program. He left into the private sector in 2011 and used that experience in developing and implementing learning solutions that meet performance standards while assuring that you retain that learned material. He has over 20 years of experience in providing professional development through the uses of instructional technology and traditional content delivery methods to improve workforce quality across multiple industries from healthcare to telecommunications and financial services, where he currently works as the Vice President of Digital Learning Design with Leadership Edge at J.P. Morgan Chase. Tom resides in Middletown, Delaware with his wife, Erin, and their three children, Ariana, Logan, and Kaylin. Then we have Dana Morano Schofield. Uh, I'm sorry, Schofield is is parenthetical. Uh, a 2014 Marist graduate, currently in Conshohocken with her husband Dan, who is also a Marist grad. We love that that Red Fox Nation showing up. Um, after graduating with a degree, a degree in psychology, she worked in a charter school in Harlem, and then went on to complete her master's and PhD in educational psychology at the City University of New York. She currently works as a research scientist in ACT's learning division 
where her research focuses primarily on the development and assessment of social and emotional skills in students. She was also an assistant adjunct professor at the City University of New York. Way too much New York in there, Dana. We need like the City University of Philadelphia, all right? You got to stay down here, but <laughs> fantastic bio. Nicholas R Russell is a fifth year graduate student in applied mathematics at the University of Delaware. He holds a BA in both secondary education and mathematics with minors in psychology and computer science from Marist in 2016. That's just fantastic. Um, that, that's way too many degrees. I got out with one. He's piling them up. Nick has participated in several research experiences and internships working for the University of Tennessee, the NIH, Army Corps of Engineers, and Oxford University. Outside of mathematics, Nick sits on the board of several organizations at the University of Delaware, such as the Graduate Committee in the Math Department, UD's Anti-Racism Initiative, and the UD chapters of SIAM, which is the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, and the Association of Women in Mathematics, along with volunteering to be on the board of directors for the Delaware Science Olympiad. Fantastic group that we have today. Ryan Kenny was born and raised in South Jersey, one of my guys, and went to high school right over the bridge from Philadelphia. After graduating in 2010 with a bachelor's of business and a minor in environmental policy, he spent a summer interviewing focused on finding an early stage tech company primed for growth, which landed him at a small tech company and Microsoft partner in Jersey City called Avpoint. He spent six years as a recruiter, helping the company grow from around 700 to 1400 employees globally before moving to Amazon Web Services, where he spent the past four and a half years supporting that business grow from about 10,000 employees to over 40,000. Ryan now leads a recruiting team at AWS focused on hiring sales and solution architects, and is passionate about cloud computing and artificial intelligence technologies. Ryan currently lives in the Fairmount neighborhood of Philadelphia, and when not working, can be found running along the Schuylkill River or learning the guitar. Pamela Lowe graduated in 2001 with a BS in business administration with a concentration in marketing. She was a two-time captain of the women's lacrosse team and recently named to Marist Honorable Mention Mac Honor Roll Team. Pamela has held several different roles in her career at Ernst & Young, including administrative, business development, and most recently a marketing role in the technology, media, and entertainment and telecommunication sector. Pamela lives in South Jersey with her husband and two young girls. She's passionate about fundraising for childhood cancer research through CHOP, or Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, after her daughter was treated for leukemia there. So we've got a couple of different uh, topics here, and, and we're going to go through this one by one. We welcome your, your questions through through the, the chat window here, if there's something that, that comes up. And we're going to have a Q&A period after that, and I'm going to uh, uh, take your questions and some of the ones that have been submitted ahead of time to, to go back to, go back to the, the, the panel. So. First up, we've got Tom, who's going to talk about virtual learning pivots, especially in the time of, of COVID. Tom? Thank you, Scott, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for having me on this. Um, one of the things that we've learned is that as a result of this pandemic, there has been an increased demand in learning and development. And there, you know, we needed it yesterday, and it was, initially was going to serve as a good time builder, right, as we thought we were going to take two weeks to flatten the curve. And so it's just a matter of providing some opportunities here and there just to help fill the time. But now we're eight months in. And, you know, I don't know if you've seen the news down here in Delaware, what's going on in Philly, you know, it's, it's now eight months in and counting. So learning and development still remains to be a remote proposition. And so one of the initial steps that was taken when Ellen, when learning and development um, had to adjust to the pandemic was like, well, let's just do what we did in the classroom and do it over Zoom and do it over webinars. And that's going to be good, good enough. Um, I don't know if, how many of you have, have children, but if you've seen the remote education experience, um, when they try to do that one-to-one -one thing, it ain't working. It ain't working, right? There are some pain points. And so the first thing that we learn is that when you go online, an instructor-led approach, a classroom-based approach is not in a, in a virtual-based approach. It's not a one-to-one -one match. Um, there are many different approaches that you have to adjust for because just the lack of presence in in in-person presence really changes the really changes the experience. Um, so some of the shifts that we've made is we went from basic self-paced online courses to shorter interactive briefings. So instead of doing a 120 minute in-person session, you may do a 30 minute webinar or a 30 minute lunch and learn or a quick 30 or even still 
like take a lecture, right? Those started to shift to Q and A sessions or like faculty office hours, you know, where you can schedule a 10 to 15 minute time slot to help support what we were doing in some of our self-paced AKA e-learning classes or doing in some of those, uh, some of those webinars that we would sit in or some of those online learning experiences. Um, a lot of our online courses used to have these large learner guides, these 60, 70 page documents. And our idea was, well, let's save money. Let's bring them all online and turn them into PDFs. Well, I can't annotate on a laptop. I can I can't um, annotate on a laptop. I can only annotate on an iPad if I have the right iPad Pro. So I, how am I going to thumb through this? How am I going to print through this? And so we started, we stopped going from large learner guides to what we call supporting the learning in the flow of work, performance support materials, resource guides, job aids, um, workflow support. So what we did is we built a resource center and we categorized it based on topics, incorporated a search engine. So if I, and so what I said is if I needed something now, type in my topic, boom, here's four or five resources that could appear that will help me for what we call that moment of need, right? Something, right? We all learn best when it's applied with, some, when it's applied to something that I need to do right now. For example, pool filters. I, I took a class in high school. I probably learned something about mechanics. Don't remember a damn thing from it because I'm not I'm not a handy person. So what I do? Go to YouTube or go get the go get the manual online. Same concept here, supporting that moment, that learning when I need it at need it right now, as opposed to when I may need it five years ago. A lot of our programs were one to two days, eight hour eight hours a day, one to two days. We had to spread all of that out to a three to six week program, ideally two hours per session or no more than two hours a week um, uh, for various reasons um, with work to be done in between. So if I had one session, maybe 90 minutes um, in, we do some work in between to, to build upon what we did in that first session and to introduce what we did in that second session, do the same thing for another 90 minutes and rinse, wash and repeat until, until the end of the program. Um, the biggest shift, however, that we're seeing really is, and this is probably relevant for many of you who are going to go into the job world, is on-demand learning has led to employees, learners, really taking ownership of their own learning. And there were two major moments that we've identified. One is moment of need. When do I need it? Those are those performance support materials. However, there's always professional development. And the key question that you always get asked on a job interview is what are you doing to keep abreast of current trends, especially when access to in-person training is so is so scarce? And so, you know, there's always this idea of that moment of want, when I want to learn something new. And what happened is we found out that a lot of our learners are now becoming curators of their own content. Google, YouTube. Uh, LinkedIn Learning, Pluralsight, Coursera, and more. And what's happening is that's empowering learners to get what they want now, as opposed to waiting for a class to be offered in, let's say, March, April, May, or June. And so really, that we're really able to meet that moment of demand. And it's actually forced learners to be more prepared for their settings. You know, normally learning was push versus pull. We'll push content out to you. Now what we're finding is that there's a balance between we'll push some content out to you, but people are also pulling content from us. And we know it's working because they're using they're using our content. So what we did is we had to really at JP Morgan Chase is combine our 16 hour two day programs for our managers, our four day uh, four hour high impact programs. And we had to take all of those things and we had to put, make them remote. And so what wound up happening is we took those one-time events and turned them into continual processes where we, where we spaced everything out over 60 to 75 minute sessions over four weeks with work before each session and after each session to help really build a crescendo, A, build learning communities, B, build a, a culture of continuous development and see really still make sure that we mean that we still meet our learning objectives because they don't change because the format change it's just how we deliver it changes to meet those objectives to ensure that we're meeting the debt the um objectives of that company and the reason why we did that is because just when you go to virtual learning and as you get into virtual learning some of the things that we had to really consider when building that framework zoom fatigue this is the first meeting i have been on that is not on zoom since 
uh, March of 2019. It's the first time we've done WebEx. So it's, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not in person, but it's more refreshing because it's not, oh, another Zoom meeting, right? Uh, and there's fatigue. So we know that like after 45 minutes, there's a law of diminishing returns and attention. You know, we have to find ways to make it interactive, but there's also still a need to socially connect, right? Especially more now more than ever because we're so dis we're so dispersed, we're so far apart. So really when we make those pivots to virtual learning, we have to make we had to make sure that we included those activities to allow for so for the social connections that you normally would that we were depriving because we had to take them out of the classroom. So, you know, and those are really what you're going to start seeing when you go into the quote unquote real world, or when you get into the corporate world, you're going to see a lot of those changes in the way that you're learning is that, A, you're going to own more of it. You're going to have more access to on-demand learning. And um, you're going to see that it's going to be spaced out over time with, with, with a series of, of breaks. Thank you, Tom. That 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 was, you know, I, I thought incredibly helpful for for understanding, you know, where we can go with that. Uh, next up, Dana, uh, on the importance of internships, and we've had some questions come in on internships, which you know, uh, for a lot of the current students on the call, uh, are, are going to kind of hopefully uh, perk up for, and and the why uh, of of the importance of that in the work that you do. So, Dana. Yeah, and thanks so much for having me here today. And thanks to Tom for kind of kicking us off with just a discussion that things are really different right now for learners everywhere, given this pandemic. You guys as learners, as college students, and then all just K-12 students that a lot of us in the education sector are serving now. Um, so that was a really great way to get us started. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was kind of um, this framing system proposed by Simon Sinek that actually has really helped me to determine kind of where to go in terms of career path. Um, when I was at Marist, I know I, I bounced around. I came in as a pre-med student within the first like month or so. It became painfully obvious that um, I can't do blood without passing out. So that kind of, you know, went downhill real quick. Um, and then it kind of just became a game of like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, you know, I'm, you know, doing all these things outside of the classroom. You know, I'm like a quote unquote overachiever if you look at like a GPA, but I, I had no idea what to do with my life. Um, so I went back and forth between fashion merch and biomed for about my sophomore year. And then um, I had an advisor who kind of proposed to me a question um, that really helped determine what I wanted to do. And instead of thinking about the what, it was thinking about the why, kind of what are your values and what are kind of, you know, the problems that you want to solve and how can you actually do that in a job? And um, so I'll start now just with my um, with my what. So what what I am currently, I'm, I'm a research scientist. Um, I'm also an assistant professor outside of my kind of nine to five job working in applied research. I work at ACT. So what we do is we kind of build both learning products and assessments for students, right? And these days our work looks a lot different given the pandemic, which is something that I'll touch on a little bit later, but how kind of, um, how did I get to the what? So how did I do it? I went to grad school and I did a PhD in educational psychology, but why kind of, why did I do these things was because um, I guess around my junior, senior year at Marist, the problem that like I kind of landed on of wanting to solve was, how to improve educational outcomes for students and particularly our most underserved students. So based on that kind of why that became clearly apparent to me, I started off um, post-grad in a charter school up in Harlem. So I was working with, um, it was a Title I school. We were working with mostly underserved students coming from you know, really high poverty levels, um, parents who had been you know, recently released or admitted to the justice system, homelessness, just kind of um heavily traumatic events if you kind of look at an aces scale that's kind of a list of traumatic events that students could have experienced throughout their lifetime most of these kids were at you know clinical levels of traumatic experience and um kind of my first year in the real world if you will um it became apparent to me that i um didn't really know enough about how to fix these problems and um, kind of defining that as a problem I wanted to solve and then structuring my graduate education and my work now around that problem was something that was really important to me. So um, I would say that my why, kind of like why I do what I do, it's because, again, I wanna improve educational outcomes for all students. 
And then how do I do that? Well, with all this training as an educational psychologist, we, you know, we work to build products and tools that teachers can use in classrooms, things like um, professional development models that um, let teachers know about, you know, what trauma looks like, um, what strategies they can use to help mitigate these things, what strategies they can use to build relationships with students and why some students who may look like they're just, you know, acting out behaviorally are actually maybe experiencing some of these traumatic events and there are alternative strategies to get there. So um, I hope that kind of helps illustrate the what, the how and the why and encourages you guys to start encouraging yourselves to ask kind of why in um, establishing what career paths you want to do and what internships you want to take and what jobs you want to pursue after you leave Marist. Um, and then another kind of related but tangential point that I wanted to make to you all is that um, internships were really important for me when I was in my kind of undergrad years, again, in helping to figure out what I did want to do, but also in what I didn't want to do. Um, I remember one of my first internships, I tried doing um, kind of like a, I was a psychology major. So there are any psychology majors who are like, oh yeah, there are about 96 different career paths you can take as a psychology major. It's kind of a little bit of, you know, a process to figure out what you want to do with it. And I remember one of my first internships, I, I totally hated and I was all, you know, upset over it. So I was like, oh my God, I got this internship. Aren't I supposed to love it? Like, I, I think this should be, you know, something that I really like doing, but um, I didn't. And realizing that I didn't want to do kind of like one particular application of psychology almost helped me more figure out what I did want to do. So um, just keep in mind for any of those, any of those of you who may be kind of dabbling in different fields, internships, subcomponents of fields that it's okay to learn from an internship that you don't want to do something almost equally as much as an internship that you do want to do. Um, so again, as Scott said, I, I work at ACT now. Um, I obviously have experience in applying to grad school, teaching through grad school, and then also working in education spaces before grad school and now after. So definitely feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, or if you just want to chat more about really anything in the education sector. And again, thank you guys for having me here today. Thank you, Dana. Uh, next up, uh, we have Nick, who's going to talk about uh, applying for grad school and for master's PhD. And, and what does that life look like? Which I think uh, is, is very kind of top of mind for a lot of you on what you decide to go uh, with your next step. So, Nick? Definitely. Thank you again for um, having me. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to, to hear all these things. And I'm actually going to kind of spearhead off of what Dana was talking about here. Um, and I'm going to share some slides that I just think will be a little bit. We, we may have lost Nick. Um, it looks like Nick is still here. At least. So, so this is a great example of, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, the importance of, of a good technology background and, and, you know, and then really being able to hold on to that. Why don't we uh, uh, give him another second or so? And if not, we'll just kind of kick down to Ryan and we'll come back to Nick when we, un, uh, you know, solve for that. Does that make sense? Since we're, we're Yeah, we're uh, I can see that Nick is having um, connection issues. So it might be better to switch to Ryan and come back. Yeah, Ryan, do you, do you mind uh, pinch hitting here, stepping in? Not at all, not at all. Amanda, I would just need to share. Oh, there we go. Okay. 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 My screen showing? Yes. Okay. All right. So, 
Uh, thanks for, for the patience there, team, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, excited to be part of today's discussion. Uh, as Scott mentioned earlier, my name is Ryan Kenny. I'm currently a uh, recruiting manager with Amazon Web Services, so it's only right that we talk about a little bit about interviewing today, and we'll focus on the, the virtual interviewing um, given uh, today's new world order. Um, we only have five minutes, so I'm going to keep it high level to the point we could talk about this for a long time. Um, interviewing today versus a pre-COVID world, the, the recommendations I provide, I would normally provide folks ahead of interviewing are mostly the same uh, with some additional things to prepare for and consider. Now we are 100% virtual. So, let's out of here. here. Um, so first, first off, set yourself up so that come interview day, the only thing you're focused on is the, the conversation and the questions being asked of you. Eliminate anything that would interrupt that focus. So test your technology. Um, we just saw a great example. Make sure your camera and mic work effectively. Um, typically, more bandwidth is used once you um, once you have video and the mic together. And then when you're sharing your screen and presenting, even more bandwidth is used, they think is the issue Nick ran into. Um, so test that. There's a, a pro tip I'll, I didn't plan on sharing, but um, if you call in, um, so if you were using WebEx today, if you call in directly um, and then pull up um, from your phone and then pull up just video um, uh, on the, the platform itself, the, the video conferencing platform, that helps cut down on the bandwidth usage and will allow you to use the functionality of the platform a little bit better. Um, Companies are using various video conferencing platforms. So Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WebEx is we're using now. So trial the platform ahead of your interview, especially have, if you haven't used it before, just so you know all the bells and whistles in case you need to use any of them during the interview. You wanna ensure you have a quiet environment um, and you have the interview space um, to do that. If you're living with family, let them know you got a big interview coming up and you're gonna need quiet during uh, a certain set of hours. If you have a dog that likes to bark, see if you can have someone watch them during the day or just give them a big old peanut butter bone to keep them occupied for a few hours. Um, you wanna make sure you also have a clean backdrop. So turn on your camera and look, using that camera, look at everything behind you, uh, the entire space behind you in the camera. Um, you'd be surprised at what we run into with folks who um, have just messy rooms. Folks are these days are using their bedrooms, attics, garages. So wherever you find yourself, uh, make sure the background is clean and tidy. Remove anything that could distract the interviewer. The last thing you want is a big pile of laundry behind you to help make a, a great first impression during your interview. Um, also ensure you have enough, enough natural lighting uh, so it's not difficult for the interviewer to see you. Um, overestimate the expectation uh, for the appropriate dress during the interview. You'll hear a lot more companies are, are shifting to more casual environments, uh, especially now all virtual, but don't assume that for your interview, even virtually overdress unless you are directly told otherwise. To the interview discussion, um, monitor your body language. If you don't have a lot of experience with virtual meetings, interviews, practice speaking in front of a camera. Pick up some interview, you know, mock interview questions offline and pretend you are responding to them live and watch yourself as you speak through the camera um, so that you're presenting yourself uh, in the way you'd like. Um, also a tip that you won't see many do today um, as we're all still getting used to virtual um, uh, engagement, but make eye contact through the camera lens. Most interviewers that you meet with won't be doing this, and it's a bit awkward at first, but looking directly at the camera provides a level of en uh, engagement that will earn trust with your interview as it mimics direct eye contact with them. Um, research the culture, you know, read the reviews, type in the company name along with the word reviews next to it in Google. And this will surely bring up Glassdoor as a common review platform, but there's also other sites out there with even more in-depth reviews, depending on the company and the industry that you're in. Understand who the competitors are, read the recent news releases, the company blog to get up to speed with the latest happenings with the company, who is the executive team, what are their backgrounds and priorities. All of this will not only help you come prepared with questions to ask the interviewer, but the more relevant questions that are gonna be important to you to make the right decision that the job is the right fit. 
Familiarize yourself with common interview questions. You know, why are you interested in the role? What's your biggest weaknesses you'll see in most interviews, as well as other behavioral questions online. Some of those review platforms I just mentioned uh, will probably share a lot of the questions companies typically use. Um, you want to also bring notes with you, um, but don't rely on them. Just have bullet points to quickly glance at so it doesn't distract you too much through natural conversation. Um, but really, the focus should be on turning this into a storytelling exercise. You really would, going into an interview, the right way to approach it is organizing at least seven to eight strong success stories from your experience that you have so far, whether it's from school, internships, or if you've already picked up some work experience. And this STAR framework shown uh, on my slides for you to reference helps organize the details of each story in an easily consumable format. Many organizations coach their interviews as well to utilize this framework during their own interviews. Um, so it'll likely align most of your conversations in that structure. And this framework will more specifically help provide a you know, help you provide a specific example based on the interviews. Um, you know, questions starting with uh, taking one to two minutes to frame up a specific example and be prepared to follow up with additional details around the specific actions that you took versus, you know, broader collaboration you may have had with the team. And a lot of the who, what, where, when, why details that'll be important uh, information the interview is looking to obtain from you. Um, make sure you're ready to quantify what the result was and how the actions you took impacted that result. Were there mistakes? learnings, takeaways. Um, it'll be good to be reflective about your experience that way. And many employers will be looking that you have the ability to do just that. And lastly, a couple points I'll, I'll leave you with. Um, if you take a lot of the steps I quickly um, brief through and um, you know, conduct some research in, in, in other ways online on how to prepare for interviews, it's just gonna allow you to be yourself. Um, which will come off very genuine to uh, the interviewer that you're interviewing with. And it'll just be, oops, it'll just allow you to uh, share some of those finer details more effectively and have more natural back and forth dialogue during your interviews. Um, also, leverage your Marist resources. One of the best things I did for myself um, in my junior year at Marist was take up an offer from one of my professors who I still think is with the business school is May Sarnecki, um, who helped me uh, conduct a mock interview with me. Uh, we went, we used the media department to record it and I bombed that interview so bad. And I'm glad I did it because I learned a ton about, um, you know, my posture, how to articulate and illustrate, uh, how to provide certain details. I got the right constructive criticism from Ms. May to go back, look at the recording and improve for, my future interviews for internships all the way into the, the interviews I did post-graduation for full-time work. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining us today. I look forward to uh, the Q&A in just a bit. Thank you, Ryan. That, that was incredibly specific and tactical advice that, that hopefully people can, can run with. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot to Pamela and then we're, we've got Nick back online and we'll get We'll get him in, in into the queue right now. So, so Pam, it, uh, if somebody can go on mute, um, Pam, if is going to talk to us about networking and the career path around mentoring. So I'll go up. Just pulling up my PowerPoint here. And. All right, you good there? Awesome. Okay, so of course doing that, uh, I have to pivot and uh, change my dual screens here. So um, I've got some technical difficulties here too. So, so every one of you has a career path that's unique and every one of us has a different aspiration for what we want to accomplish our careers. In each phase of our lives, we have different priorities outside of our jobs, which could impact our career aspirations. So Scott mentioned, my name is Pamela Lowe, and at 41 years old, I can tell you that my career aspirations are different than they were when I graduated from Marist at 22. I found over time that with each company I've worked for, each manager, 
that I've had and the colleagues that I've worked for, worked with, and mentors and coaches that have taken me under their wing that I holistically can evaluate what I feel is most important to me in my career. So for me, these things are having a challenging and meaningful work through interesting projects, um, having a, a, a positive and fun team environment that's open and inclusive, and working for an organization with a defined purpose, including social responsibility and diversity and inclusiveness as top priorities, and having an ability uh, to own my own schedule so that I can balance priorities at work and at home. Uh, two young kids at home, so uh, that obviously wasn't a priority for me at 22 years old and it is now today. So paring down these priorities didn't happen overnight. And as I mentioned earlier, um, those priorities have changed and will likely change again as my career progresses. Establishing a clear set of priorities came from building a network of mentors, coaches, and sponsors. So what's the difference between uh, a mentor, a coach, and a sponsor? The mentors, mentors for me are people who hold a more senior position or hold a position um, that I aspire to have one day. Um, they might be in your industry specifically, or they might not. Um, this can be a formal relationship or informal. Um, coaches, on the other hand, are a more formal role. They help you establish tasks for achieving your goals, and they can help with exploring career transitions or skills improvements that you'd need to make those transitions. And then a sponsor is someone that works at a company where you're aspiring to work or specifically is within a department where you're looking for a job. And they're influential in the hiring decision, and they can speak on your behalf. Um, this was a, a good summary that I liked. A mentor will talk with you, a coach will talk to you, and a sponsor will talk for you. This uh, personally is a bit of a snapshot of my career progression since I've left Maris. Um, I starting off with an industrial flooring company um, in South Jersey, skimming over the real estate company I worked for when I was there, when I first moved to Philly, because that was the strangest job ever, and I was only there for four months, thankfully. <laughs> And then working for an insurance broker um, and ultimately on to EY where um, um, I've had several different roles. So with each of these roles, I've been fortunate enough to establish networks of coaches, mentors, and sponsors. And these have helped me achieve my personal and professional growth. Um, this took a lot of brain power for me to organize here because not everybody is specifically in that box. There's been people that have transitioned for me, like uh, at, at the insurance brokerage, who was then a, a sponsor for me or a coach for me to get to the to into EY. Um, and I, I know this is just you know it's 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 funny to look back and establish who mentors and sponsors were even in my first job out of college because I didn't formally know that definition. Um, but certainly those roles happen sort of naturally over time, and I would certainly define those as such. So I want to share the importance of, um, I borrowed this from our campus recruiting team at UI uh, that, you know, service the UI team. So I've stolen some of their slides. So um, Bob Patton, UI's America's Vice Chair said, technical skills are great, analytical skills are too, but always invest heavily in your relationships. So to highlight some of the key components of building a strong network, you want your relationships to be relevant. You want to have shared common interests with people, um, so that those are real connections. Make them personal. Know more about a person than what their title is on LinkedIn. You know, what are their interests? What do they do for fun? Do they have kids? What are their kids' names? What do they do on the weekends? You know, are you a soccer coach? Are you, um, you know, you go for hikes with friends or out to dinner at restaurants? Um, and that relationship building should also be knowledge sharing. It needs to be a two-way street. So it can't just be a take relationship. You should be sharing what you know and helping to elevate others in your network. To wrap up, uh, this is another, uh, this is this is relevant a lot to the students that are on here. This is helping you build a, a rock star network. Um, it seems to be paired more towards the students and not necessarily the alumni on the call. Um, but your peers can be part of your network. The alumni, um, uh, our panelists can all wave. They can be part of your network as well. And then professionals, so campus events and career fairs, firm sponsored events, um, that sort of thing. 
to, to wrap up, there's another quote that was brought up here is, as you think about your career, it's about what pathways you're going to build and not fences. Um, but I want to highlight the importance of being your authentic self and building a strong, strong and meaningful relationships with other people. I think that will help you build passion for what you're doing um, and a commitment for the company that you work for and how you're developing yourself. Um, and it'll give you more job satisfaction um, to know if you're in the right place. So, thank you. Thank you, Pamela. And and I, I related to a lot of what you said just from my own big four background. Uh, we used a lot of the same terms at Deloitte, like authentic self and and certainly the, the importance of your personal brand and, and building your network is is crucial. So um you know, I invite uh, all of you who are who are on there, find me on LinkedIn. You know, that's the point of the, of these is to build a better network, you know, back to the school amongst current students as well as amongst us alums so that we can kind of foster a strong community. So we've got Nick back on the line. We're gonna get uh, Nick's presentation going now. So thank you, Pamela. Nick. Thank you again for having me. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I, I apparently need to listen to some of Ryan's tips uh, to get my network <laughs> all running in the end. Um, I'm gonna just talk briefly about a little bit about grad school. I came into Marist wanting to be a high school math teacher. And then I realized once I took differential equations, that I like math too much, uh, which is not a sentence that almost anybody else says. But I took, um, I took that and I, I decided at that point that I kept wanting to ask the question why. Um, and I kept wanting to feel this idea of research. So like going to grad school seemed like such an afterthought going back, going into college. But as I started to, you know, develop myself in, in college, I got to do some research experiences. I took a part in the, um, um, an REU, which is a research experience for undergraduates. And that was kind of a mini grad school. And I saw that I wanted to do that and I went forward. So internships are very, very helpful and, and kind of those research experiences. When you're applying to grad school, um, you always want to think about a couple of things when you're thinking about picking a school just in general. The first thing is program culture. I find that um, a lot of different schools have lots of different cultures about them. Even this is, this is for STEM, this is for humanities, this is for any kind of um, university. You have different cultures, you have a collaborative environment, you have more individual, individualistic environments. Before you pick a school and before you actually decide to go to that school, go and visit the campus go, if you can. Unfortunately, in Zoom, Zoom levels are a little bit tough to do these days. Um, but if you can try to talk to some people, email some grad students, ask them about it. They're more than willing to answer questions. I have several times I've answered some, some questions from students that wanna you know, apply here. It's really important. Um, there are some other, app, uh, when you're applying, there are some waivers for your application fee. Some application fees can be um, disturbingly high around $100, $150. But if you are part of some groups or you've done some experiences, you might be able to get application waivers. So I would definitely take advantage of those. Um, one thing you want to do when you're at that university and try to figure out, you know, um, if it's right for you is where are your opportunities to grow? Do you have professional development opportunities? For instance, at the University of Delaware, we have several opportunities here um, in, in, within the department for different clubs and different um, professional development events. Um, and also across campus, we have some different internships. We have these programs where you're able to research your first summer and get, uh, get funding to do so. Um, that's a really important thing. And also, if you're applying to PhD programs, you wanna know how you're getting funded. You wanna know, am I gonna be doing teaching? Am I gonna be doing research? Am I gonna be doing you know, grading or something along the lines of that? But by knowing that, um, you can kind of you know, figure out, you know, is this kind of a path I want to go? When you're applying, there's two main things that grad committees look for. Um, they have your personal statement and you have your references. References kind of deal back to networking. You want to have, have people that you that you know really well and who have supervised you or can talk about yourself, either people that you maybe have done a research experience with or your advisor at Marist or somebody else um, that, that, has, that has, has seen you develop. Um, and can speak to that. You don't want to just pick any random people that you maybe have just gotten a good grade in in their class. You want to know somebody that you have some form of a rapport with. Um, in your personal statement, they basically want to think you want you want to convince the um, your audience that you're um, prepared to do research, that you're prepared to 
um, you know, become a, let's say, mathematician, become a scientist, become a, um, a professor. You want to convince them that what makes you stand out and why do you want to go to grad school? You want to keep asking yourself that why over time. And as the life of a graduate student, um, it has changed a little bit um, over time. Um, you know, your first couple of years, you're taking classes and you're taking exams. Um, you have some of these preliminary and oral exams, so you have to take those courses. You have to take those um, exams to move on forward in the program. Um, but that's what's kind of really interesting. Um, you know, you're finally taking classes you want to take. You're, you're taking these courses, you're meeting people, you're um, connecting with all these different professors and starting your research. Um, and there's a lot of different opportunities and research experiences um, to, 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 to go for. And I highly suggest if you ever do go to grad school and you do um, go into a PhD program or something like that, it's really important that you always keep seeking those out because it gives you options on what you want to do after you leave. It's, it's really important in that way. Um, there is a lot of work, just in general. I consider it the 100 round boxing match. Uh, you're going to get hit down a lot of times. I did not do very well at the beginning of, of my grad program. I was I felt a little bit farther behind. I even had some imposter syndrome. and I still have that. Um, and that's kind of almost pervasive in academia. But what's amazing is if you pick a program, and it's really important to pick a program, pick people around you that you can kind of fail, but come back and they'll bring you back up. And that's what a lot of grad school is. It's about bringing people with you and it's not a competition. It's all about trying to get to that finish line and get, get, get your degree and also keep remembering your why. Why do you want to go to grad school? The people that complete grad school are not the smartest, they're the ones with the most drive. And that's a really important thing to remember. Um, yeah, and I, 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 I've found that over time, my why has changed and grad school has changed, unfortunately now because of this, uh, this, this pandemic. Um, a lot of programs are, for instance, um, not taking as many students this upcoming year. Um, that's that's uh, because of all the cuts. Um, but there are, um, you know, um, a lot of times when you apply, you have to, you know, give your GRE scores, you have to give some um, application waiver, application fees and stuff like that. A lot of them are being waived, which is good. So you're able to apply more. You don't need to uh, take the GRE for a lot of schools now. Um, and there's different ways that they're trying to um, manipulate that. So um, if you have any questions about grad school, feel free to email me or anything like that. I'm currently trying to search for a job afterwards. So my networking is really picking up at this point. So um, I, with that, I will end there. But thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, uh, we've got a number of questions here, and I want to uh, you know move to them quickly. So. Um, in, in no particular order here. So we've got one here from the audience um, uh, around uh, and, and Ryan and Pamela and, and, and you know, I'll even take maybe a little swing at this too. Uh, companies where, where you're, you know, that are working on artificial intelligence. So how, how do their positions and companies foresee AI development coming into play in the future and whether they think this is a benefit to their companies or any detriments they think this can pose in the marketplace? sort of a wide ranging topic there. Um, I, I guess it's sort of like, where do we see the, the, the field of AI going? And, and you know, uh, maybe if we can track it back to, where do you think the opportunities are for, for, for Marist graduates to, 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 you know, find opportunities there? Uh, I, can, I can start. Sure. Uh, certainly EY has a, a, a big AI, consultancy um, as Deloitte does as well. Uh, so there's certainly work field, um, at EY. I would say that if, if this person was asking that specifically at a current student, um, it, our internship program is, is not um, that sector or the, those types of positions, the consultancy are, are much fewer and far between for our internship program. Um, so it might be a little bit more of an experienced hire uh, type of role. Um, but AI is certainly implemented in a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, uh, to make things automated, it is opportunities for, you know, different brain power, for people to think differently and utilize skills differently than, uh, you know, just crunching numbers the way that we used to before. So it's not going away. Um, so we need to embrace it uh, and, and help uh, learn new skills. That's also part of the learning development and, and just constantly evolving personally so that 
um, so your skills aren't the just the basic crunching numbers. It's it's the uh, the big picture thinking. Yeah, you, you know, from from my own perspective, uh, and, and my background is actually in sort of e discovery and machine learning type of tools to to help find data forensically uh, around litigation. So I would I would think about this um, uh, for for the for the questioner in terms of use cases. You know, what is what what is the artificial intelligence solving for? And and if you're you want to kind of like get in front of that, and this is really more maybe more like applied AI if you want to think of it that way versus sort of just algorithms for algorithms sake. But but what are you solving for gets you probably a, a, a leg up on on your competition in terms of how you can just take that thinking and, and do something with it in the marketplace. Uh, with my company, we, we find data that's relevant for privacy concerns or for litigation uh, across huge data stores. So that's that's just one use case. Ob obviously there's search, you know, Google uses it to sell ads, right? So, you know, I mean, they're not a search company anymore, they're an advertising company, but anyway, uh, I don't, Ryan, I don't know if your experience at AWS, if you if you run into this or or if you're you're a little more removed from these things. You're on mute, sir. Too, too many mute buttons, sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm in no way a techie, but, you know, I think if it, you, it's a transformational technology, it's very early. So if we look at different industries, like, you know, in the customer service industry, we'll start to use AI assistance. If we're talking about trans, uh, the transportation industry, autonomous cars are certainly on the horizon um, in education. Textbooks are, are are digitized with the help of AI. Um, you know, early stage virtual tutors assist human um, more human instructors. We're going to see AI impact different industries in a number of different ways. Um, and I think part of that question, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, was just the uh, kind of gearing back towards the opportunity and how do I get involved? And um, you know, I think there you can you can you know, go after companies who are developing uh, artificial intelligence solutions and, and bringing products to bear on in, into different industries. Um, uh, especially if you if you are technical and want to be on the cusp of of uh, of developing, helping develop this technology and bring it to different industries. Um, or as Pamela mentioned, right, there are a lot of companies, you know, that have large that are building large internal teams within their technical or IT departments that um, will specialize and help um, adopt uh, some of the newer artificial uh, artificial intelligence technology. So, um, yeah, I, you know, there's there's a, there's different directions you can go, and I think industries will will start to dictate that uh, as it becomes more ingrained. Yeah, and, and I think there's a scale too. I I, I left a, a firm of a hundred thousand people in the U.S. To join a tech startup doing this, with and I was employee number ninety. So it all kind of depends on your risk appetite a little bit too. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Ryan, real quick because you're off mute. Um, what do the most impactful interviews uh, uh, have as like a trait, right? So uh, or consist of, in your opinion. Um, so in regards to like, how does an applicant stand out or make a great impression? So any kind of like, I guess, best practices for for interviewing tips. That you can think of besides what you kind of covered uh, in in your slides. Sure. So, um, if I heard applicant and I heard interview on an applicant side, you know, fix up your your resume to align to the job itself, but don't stop at the application. Most of the work should happen after the application um, or ahead of it, and getting connected with the right folks. Um, I think LinkedIn is probably the, the most relevant tool to, you know, they'll have each company has their own groups. And so you could sift through um, the teams and try to find, you know, the likely hiring managers for the role that you're applying to and try to get connected with them directly. You could just search in LinkedIn the, the title of the role that you're applying to and try to find folks who are on that team. And typically, if you look at profiles, you'll see, you know, uh, folks who, you know, other profiles that folks are typically looking at, and it's usually their leader or their manager. Um, and so you can use LinkedIn as a tool to get to, to as an extra step to get in front of the right folks, um, per, you know, that are specific to the roles that you're applying to. Um, from an interview uh, perspective, uh, you know, 
the preparation it, it just it, it's 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 a lot of work um but it's required to really to really wow and i think we'll, i'll just go back to what i mentioned is to try to set yourself up to turn this into a storytelling exercise as best you can spend a lot of time going back and creating a list of just success stories and or accomplishments that you've had in the experience that you have and and make sure you have all the details tied to that that experience or that success or accomplishment so that you can tell a good story. You can set up that situation. You can give the finer details and data points if it's required. You can you know, pr you know, provide any kind of measurable impact from things that you worked on specifically um, that'll make you stand out. And if you could prepare those, store, those, those situations into great stories and just turn into a story, you know, turn the interview into a storytelling exercise, it's, things are just gonna feel much more natural uh, and you're just going to come off much more genuine, um, and that just resonates really well with uh, with most interviewers. Great, great. Uh, Nick and Dana, uh, I'm going to I'm going to throw one your way here. Uh, there's a question asking for advice on how to find science internship opportunities. Since you both have a a STEM background, more or less, right? So if you if you've got some insights there that you could share with the group. Yeah, you're, um, um, yeah. the, oh, sorry, Dana, go ahead if you're, if you're going. Uh, you can go ahead if you take it okay. off. So, so especially for undergraduates, um, one of the biggest ones for internships is the NSF. The NSF has several um, uh, internships and our, uh, research experiences um, that you can definitely go into. Um, I know that there are several laboratories across the United States. Um, if you're working at a national lab, you can definitely look at those. Um, there are um, I think like 15 or 20 na uh, national laboratories, which are always looking for interns, especially in STEM programs. And there are also just small little, um, I think a lot of the organizations, so if you have, if you're in the math, right, the MAA or the AMS has websites where you can just go on there and they have a whole list of experiences that you can kind of use. Um, I don't, there's probably similar ones for each like physics or, or chemistry or something like that. Those are the main ones, at least, that I would highly consider because those are the more prestigious, I mean, the, the more recognizable ones. There might be littler ones here and there, though. Yeah, definitely professional affiliations, I think, is going to be one of your best bets. Um, so, for example, AERA is the American Educational Research Association. They'll generally post a ton of internship opportunities for undergrad and both grad students. And then also, um, don't necessarily always feel like you have to limit yourself to academia. A lot of industry positions will also have internship programs. For example, ACT has a ton of internship opportunities for both um, students kind of in more research-based, generally mathematics, statistics-based, in addition to education students. But there are also internship opportunities in other sectors too, things like you know marketing, business communications, et cetera. So definitely look both inside and outside of academia. And NSF is also a really good place to look, as Nick mentioned earlier. Yeah, you know, that's a great point, Dana. Um, uh, two weeks ago, George Kotsoftis gave a, 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 a talk to a lot of the students. He's the president of Honeywell's Advanced Materials Group, and he was Marist class of 91, and just the guy who would sleep on my couch, right? Like back then. So. The, one, I think, you know, the importance of networking and two, reaching into your base of like other alumni. He was talking about, hey, I, I, I'm in a field that does applied scientific, um, um, you know, research and, and development and manufacturing. So, uh, you know, for, for, for those of you asking those questions, that there's one. There's one more here and I'll kind of leave it up for the, the, the whole group. Um, and that's really kind of, uh, there's two questions, but they're sort of the same theme advice and tips, and I think we've covered a lot of these, on developing a career path during this sort of pandemic work remote. How do, how do we make it work when we're all on a call and we never meet in person, right? Like I joined a company in the middle of this pandemic. I haven't met anyone yet. You know, I, I, I physically have not been in a room with anybody I've been working with for the last four and a half months. Like just, I found the job online. I interviewed it online. I got it. I work every day through through my 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 Mac. So if you all have any any other insights, I mean, for me, uh, and and I think Pamela, you touched on this, and a few others touched on it. The importance of your network, um, 
finding that the importance of your personal brand. What are you known for? Like, and that's how people found me through LinkedIn um, and, and knew of me as a, an expert in my field. Um, and, and I could stand out and differentiate from my market. But I don't know if anyone else has any insight of like, uh, you know, maybe Tom from like a continuing education kind of perspective. A anybody uh, on the panel, if you've got any last thoughts on that as, before we wrap up. Yeah, I, I think the one thing really to be important is even just is be flexible. Um, you know, there are right now everybody. This is an uncertain time, and a lot of one of the things that that we've learned as a result of COVID is that we've had to perform tasks or participate on teams that where we may have felt like a fish out of water or go something that's outside of our comfort zone. But you know that, but that flexibility, like for example, being in learning and development. Right, I was a teacher. I knew nothing about student loans while well, being, you know, working on training programs to help you learn more about that industry. Same with healthcare, telecommunications, financial services, all very highly regulated, all very complex. But, you know, the flexibility, the ability to flex and learn while you're flexing, right, and, and really being an owner of your learning and a curator of your learning is really going to help you move is going to help you progress in your careers as you move on. And it's actually going to open you up to a lot of opportunities that right now at 20, 24 years old, you're not, you're not even, you're not even aware of right now, but someone on those multi-functional or those cross-functional teams that you're working on is going to say, Hey, look at that person. That person is really sharp. And I think this is somebody who could do really, even though they're not in my department, I think this is somebody who can really add value to my team. And you, and sometimes you just step into a pile of mud and it comes up smelling like roses and it's, and it's just because of that flexibility. Great. Great. So I, I, I see that we're at, we're at time. Um, uh, I, I appreciate, you know, everybody, uh, from the panel, uh, Tom and, and Dana and, and Nick, Ryan, uh, Pamela, you know, fantastic insights from your careers. And, and I, for one, super appreciate you being part of our inaugural Philly chapter event. Um, it's it's going to be the first of a series. We've been doing some of these at the, the, the whole alumni level. You know, we had uh, Jose Seal, the president from Restaurant Brands International, who was my other freshman roommate. Uh, he, so he's a, the CEO of Burger King and Tim Hortons at Popeyes. Gave a great speech uh, to, to students um, uh, with the school. George Katsoftis did it. So bringing business leaders from the Marist community back to the school um, helps us as a school differentiate from everybody else. If you're a student now, I, I think you should feel good about, you know, your attendance at Marist right now. Like there's a lot of value here and there's a caring community that wants you to succeed. Your success is our success. So, and we want you to be active members of our of our alumni association in a few months or a year or two, whenever you graduate. You know, uh, and I'm very grateful for everybody on on this panel and for how giving you are of your time today. Um, and hopefully, very soon, we'll we'll have a chapter event where we're all together and 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 kicking back a a, a beverage or two and and having a good time and. Maybe Marist basketball will win a game too. That we can, we'll just, do, we'll, you know, we'll we'll get our we'll get our arms around around something. You know, um, I'm from the class that matriculated, and we haven't been back to the tournament since. So, you know, that's that's a curse that that we all carry. Um, but again, thank you all very much for for coming, Amanda. I don't know if you have any last words or. Yeah, just two really quick things. One, uh, you mentioned a webinar with George Kostafis. He's actually doing another one tomorrow at noon. So I just dropped the link in the chat. If anyone is interested in signing up for that, you're still welcome to do so. Um, if anyone, any of your friends, or if you wanted to come back and see a specific part of this event, um, we will put this up on our website in the next day or so. Um, so that you can review it or share it with somebody else if there was something that stood out to you as meaningful. Um, but that is really all um, that I have to say. Again, thank you, Scott, Dana, Ryan, Tom, Nicholas, and Pamela. You guys are wonderful. Appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye.